Praise God. Uh, we are so sorry for the technical issues. Welcome back. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we are still on the um, how we can identify the message of the kingdom. And I've led emphasis that the kingdom message is on the emphasis of the king and his kingdom. And when the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it's revealing the king and, and his kingdom. Uh, but we are in the days when man teaches the kingdom and the king is not being seen. And the kingdom is not being emphasized on. Uh, so we must know that the emphasis is the king and his kingdom. Uh, we also said that when the gospel of the kingdom uh, is being taught, it magnifies and exhorts Christ. Now, because Christ is the uh, central theme of the gospel, Christ is the theme of the gospel, it will impart the fullness and the nature of God. When the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it transmits the fullness, the nature of Christ in us. It brings us to the place where uh, Christ has been formed in us and we become the express image of God. Hallelujah. Uh, we also said that it is the, um, it reveals the nature of God. It's unveiling the nature of the Father. So when we are seeing other nature, such as pride, covetousness, greed, they are not the nature of the Father. Uh, there was a, a, a case where uh, someone stole money. And when he was asked, he said that he was inspired to do so when the pastor was preaching. Something was, you know, telling him, go and take money from your office. And, you know, such is not um, revelation of, 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 of Christ. Then it reveals eternal life. It reveals eternal life. So the gospel of the kingdom is a revelation of eternal life. And don't forget in our definition of um, the gospel of the kingdom, we made mention of um, the proclamation of endless life, eternal life upon creation, the reign of righteousness and endless life. So the gospel of the kingdom is a message that point main to Christ. When the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it point main to Jesus. Not pointing us to things, not pointing us to a place, it is pointing us to a being. I always tell people that our journey in God is not just a place, it's beyond a place. It's a being. That's why he said that which have been from the beginning, which our eyes have seen. So it's about the person of Jesus Christ. So we also said that it is, uh, it judges the works of darkness. When the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it judges the work of darkness. Hallelujah. So when the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it tears hunger, more hunger. It tears hunger in us for more of Christ, for more of Christ, for more of his nature, for more of his life. Then these are, are how we know that this is the gospel of the kingdom. When there is a hunger, when that, you know, a, a teaching, when there's tearing hunger for Jesus. Hallelujah. So when the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it equip and make us ready for the work of the ministry. It makes us ready. It, it, it built the zeal of the Lord inside of us. Hallelujah. Uh, it also reveals crucifixion and the suffering of the kingdom. It reveals crucifixion and the suffering of the kingdom. Amen. Then it also empower, it equip and empower us for the world to come. So the gospel of the kingdom equip and empower us for the world to come. 
um, second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, we, according to his promises, we are looking for the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So they're equipping us for the world to come. Uh, when the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it judges carnal nature in man. It judges carnal nature. It is revealing to you that this thing that is there is not Christ. Uh, this thing that is there is not Christ. Therefore, you must judge it. You must judge it immediately. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Okay. When the gospel of the kingdom is being taught, it revealed Christ as king and the judge of all. Hallelujah. Praise God. So these are all that we did uh, last Thursday today. We are looking at what I captured or what I call the threefold mystery of the gospel of the kingdom. The threefold mystery of the gospel of the kingdom. We must understand that the gospel of the kingdom is a threefold mystery. Hallelujah. So we cannot claim to have captured the gospel of the kingdom until we have fully captured and understand the threefold mystery of the gospel of the kingdom. It's a three-dimensional message. So these threefold mysteries of the kingdom are the sum total of Christ. They are sum total of all the messages of the kingdom. So the harnessing of these ministries, they are to groom us to the place of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, uh, these threefold mysteries, they are the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now in all the in all the revelation of Jesus in the scripture, we could see the threefold mysteries being unveiled. When Jesus was teaching, we could see them. So we could also see the three dimensional mysteries in the ark of Noah. Now for the ark of Noah, they are a kind of a three-story building. Amen. Where the animals are, where the Noah sons and the, the upper is where Noah and his wife. We could also see the three-dimensional uh, mystery of the gospel of the kingdom in the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle that, that God asked him to build. We could also see that in the feast of Israel. Praise God. Now, because uh, the Feast of Israel is a three-dimensional message. The tabernacle is a three-dimensional message. The teachings of Jesus, they were three-dimensional message. Now, now, this is what sum up the gospel of the kingdom. So, we must understand that. Now, I must understand to say that uh, when Jesus was teaching the parable, he said that that one that brought forth fruit, it brought three dimensional fruit. The first was the 30 fold. The second we expect is the 60 fold. Then the third is the 100 fold. You could see that. He said he first of all brought the, the ear, the blade, then the full corn. The Lord spoke to Israel, three times you shall appear before me in a year, uh, the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Tabernacle. Now, the uh, temple, the Tabernacle of Moses was divided into three. Praise God. The outer court, the inner court, and uh, the most holy place. It's a three-dimensional message. We'll come to explain that in detail so that you will understand. So we could also see that three-dimensional message in the epistles. I write unto you, now children, the outer court, the Passover, the thirtyfold. I write unto you, young men, that's Pentecost, inner court, 
60 fold. Then I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him. I write unto you, fathers, most holy place, the feast of the tabernacle, the hundredfold. And that is the realm where Noah and his wife abode. Praise God. So we could see that the gospel of the kingdom is a threefold message. Like I was going to say, that God has declared the end from the beginning. When we go to the beginning, we see what God wants to realize upon the earth. So when Jesus was talking, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, what Jesus was actually saying, go and study Noah and know the realities, mysteries of the kingdom hidden there. Now, because you must understand that the kingdom is not just ordinary teaching. They are mysteries of Christ. That's why I said there are levels of, in understanding the gospel of the kingdom. There's a level of John the baptism. The level of knowing that what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing were wrong. And we condemn them. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. So John began to condemn. Began to tell, The kingdom is coming. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But yet, John was not unfolding the mysteries of the kingdom until Jesus came. So when Jesus came, Jesus began to unfold the mysteries of the kingdom. And uh, the strangers could not understand. The disciple came and asked him, why were you speaking to them in parable? Jesus said, it is given unto you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So there are mysteries of the kingdom that is given to the disciples to understand. That's why they say, a level in God you cannot understand until you are made part of that team. Now, for example, we can't understand the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation, they are the mysteries given to the bride alone. It wasn't given to the whole church. It wasn't given to the apostate church. That's why that book have not been understood by men. It was given, you know, for the bride to understand. So when Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, he simply means when you go to the book of Noah, you will see the mysteries of the kingdom. When the Lord asked Noah to build an ark, he said it's going to be a three-dimensional ark. Hallelujah. The ark of Noah was a three-dimensional, you know, praise God. So, now, the Lord gave him measurement. And all of those measurements, they are prophecies. They are declaring the things that God uh, was to do on the earth. He said that the land should be 300 cubits. That talks about it's going to be the full redemption the 300 cubit is going to be the full redemption. Now the height is going to be um, the, it's going to be 50 cubit. That talks about 50 is a number of jubilee that I'm bringing the entire creation to the jubilee of the Lord. And also, uh, the, bridge, uh, okay, the bridge is 50, the height is 30. Now 30 is a measure of a perfect man, a measure of of a governmental man. Now because you don't come to the throne. You don't reign. They don't confer on you. You know. That authority to reign. Until you come at 30. We could see that. Praise God. David was anointed. But he couldn't reign. Until he was 30. Until he was 30. Jesus came. Jesus lived life for he couldn't start ministry until he was 30. So David started at 30. Jesus also started at 30. Joseph could not reign until Joseph was 30. Hallelujah. A priest will start his assignment at 25. But the high priest... Must be 30. So we could see that God had already concluded the mysteries of the kingdom in the ark. That's why he mentioned Noah's ark. 
Jesus mentioned Noah's ark. So there's a law to study on Noah's ark that has. So Noah's ark is a mystery of the kingdom. But we must understand that that mystery is a three dimensional. Now God said to when 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 Noah set forth on a journey, it took seven months for the ark to rest on Mount Ararat. So after the whole judgment, it took seven months that declares they are the feast of the tabernacle and the Noah and his family. Noah and his sons came on Mount Ararat. That's what you could see in a Revelation chapter 14. Christ, the Lamb, and the company of Christ was found on the mount in the book of Revelation chapter 14. Now they have come for the government of the earth. So Noah and his sons were to begin the new generation, the new earth. So it would take Christ and his sons uh, to begin the new generation. Hallelujah. Praise God. So like I was saying that the gospel of the kingdom is a three um, dimensional message. The mount speaks of the hallelujah. Praise God. So go and study Noah's ark. The mountain that they arise speak of the climax of revelation. It speaks of Christ and the saint arriving at Mount Zion. That is Noah and his sons. That is Christ and the same company ruling the nations of the earth, bringing forth the kingdom of God. That's why when Noah, when, 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 when Noah and his son came on the mountain, God reinforced again the mandate given to Adam upon them. So Christ and his sons, they are coming to, you know, you know, you know, you know, reinforce the mandate of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let them have dominion. Let them administer um, God's life, God's will upon the creation. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the three-dimensional building, like I said, is speaking of um, the three mysteries of the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we are, are going to study this in detail when we start to, um, when we begin to talk on the redemptive pattern. Now, if we understand this, we won't have, we won't be questioning is the new birth, the end of salvation. Now, because it's a threefold journey. We are being saved. That is what we must know about the first phase of the journey. The first phase of the journey is the Passover dimension. The second phase of the journey, now because I need to get saved. That is the whole essence of the Passover. Hallelujah. Passover is a representation of the salvation and that is the first work in redemptive program. So each, each Israel who we are pattern of the journey. In Acts of Apostles chapter 7, um, Stephen called them the church in the wilderness. So the church in the wilderness, they had salvation encounter in Egypt. They had the second phase in the wilderness. And then Canaan was the third dimension of the message of the kingdom. Now that's why uh, if you read the book of Revelation chapter 11, he spoke of, he said, in Egypt where our Lord was crucified. Now I want to ask you a question. How did our Lord crucify in Egypt? Was Jesus crucified in Egypt? He was actually referencing the Passover that happened in the Egypt. And the Passover that happened in the Egypt, the lamb, the slew, was actually our Lord himself, Jesus Christ. So Israel have to leave Egypt by the slaying of the lamb. If you remember, <coughs> Paul talked about that that the rock that followed them was Christ. So Christ was journeying with them 
in that journey also. Hallelujah. So they had that experience. So in the wilderness, they now had encounter at Sinai. That is second dimensional journey. And then there's a journey towards Canaan. That's why I say, I write unto you children. That's the first dimension. We are being saved. The outer court. We are being saved. The outer court. Where the lamb is being slain. Then the second, we, we are saved. We are being saved. We are being saved. We are, he is working on us. We are being saved. We are eating shoe bread in the inner court. We are the Holy Ghost is guiding us, downloading the will of God, bringing us to understanding the seven candle light. They are shining in us. That's what we're being saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope somebody is getting understanding in, uh, in what I am sharing. We are being saved. And then, hallelujah, and then we shall be saved. We shall be saved. If you study scripture, all the oppressions of God, they are in threefold dimension. Like I said, the first is the representation of the outer court. Israel left Egypt. The thirtyfold, the blade, the children dimension, the uh, the sea. Hallelujah. The fourth sea to the fifth sea. Then water baptism. Jesus crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. These are the first dimensional message of the gospel of the kingdom. So we must understand that. And it is represented by the slain lamb. So anywhere you see the slain lamb, it's referring to Passover. It's referring to the outer court. It's referring to be saved. It's referring to the work of salvation that Christ came and perfected in us. Praise God. And the fruit of that is repentance. The effect of the first dimensional message is to grant us repentance. And that is what the, that's the reason why in the feast of Passover, what they have verse is barley. That's why when John was talking, John said, bring forth fruit meant for repentance. It was in the season of the barley harvest. Bring forth seed, you know, you know bring forth fruit meant for repentance. So, um, when we look at the second mystery of the gospel of the kingdom, the second mystery of the gospel of the kingdom. Now, you see, when the move of God started, we have what you call the orthodox. And the orthodox church, all the emphasis is on the first fold, the first dimension of the gospel of the kingdom, being that we are saved. We are washed by the blood of the Lamb. We are washed by the blood of the Lamb. And that was actually what Martin Luther restored to the church. He restored the fourth dimension message to the body of Christ. After the dark age, after the work of the church fathers, darkness set in. The, 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 the gospel of Christ was, was fully leavened even in church history. It's called the dark age. But thank God for what God is doing. God said, I will restore what caterpillar, the canker worm, all of those things that they have eaten up. And God began a revival by the German priest. Now because in Numbers 10, he said that the trumpet must be sounded by the priest. He started the walk, redemptive walk. And all the work that he did, Luther did, they were all, they were all Passover work. He didn't do beyond Passover work because the first must be restored. The first mystery must be unfolded. Jesus came. He unfolded the first. He said, go at Jerusalem and wait for the second work. And they have to give us rain. And they say that that rain is the early rain. Then at the end of the age, 
we are going to start the third fold, which will be opened by the latter rain. So we must understand the progressive nature of these things. Hallelujah. So that's why we have what is called the Orthodox Church. That what Orthodox Church was bettered by the revelation of Luther. Every other revival that followed, they were reviving what Luther bettered. Hallelujah. Now because Luther, his greatest emphasis is that justification must be by faith. And that is our response to the finished work of Christ. That I can't be saved until I respond by faith to the finished work of God. I can't get saved by penance. I can't get saved by good work. I can't get saved by going to church. For me to be saved, I must respond to the finished work of the Lamb. I must respond to the Lamb that was slain. The Lamb that was slain, I must respond to it. So every other revival that follows suit, the revival of John Wesley, John Kevin, all of them were the outer court, the, the, the Passover dimensional message because all they were talking, repentance, sanctification. And that is what we saw at the outer court, the brazen altar and the brazen lava. Hallelujah. And after that, many, many years, God opened to the church the second phase of the gospel of the kingdom, which is what we call the Pentecost, and a revival, and, and there was an appalling in America that they call a uh, Azusa revival. And what we saw was the opening of the Pentecost reign. Now, because Pentecost is always associated with rain. So that rain fell. It associated with rain, it also associated with fire. That rain fell. There was manifestations of Pentecost. And this is what separated, you know, Pentecost from the Orthodox Church. There was the restoration of tongues. There was restoration of tongues, prophecy, manifestation, healing, and all of those things. They were restored back to church. Now, this is the, the second dimension that is represented by the Pentecost. Now, the understanding of this is very key. Now, because, you see, in all the entire scriptures, the whole scripture is structured with this three-dimension message. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus Christ. Are we together? So, now, like I said, now, the Azusa was a representation of the second dimension. So, what do we see in the second we saw, we see the lamb stand. Amen. We see the lamb stand as a sign. We see the lamb stand. We see the feast of Pentecost represented by the inner court. Receiving of the law at Sinai. The 64 message. The ear. The young man. The sixth seal to the sixth, the sixth seal to the sixth trumpet. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost baptism. The infilling at the upper room. Hallelujah. What is the fruit of this? The fruit is the, the fruit of the spirit which is seen at the lampstand in the inner court. Now when you get to the lampstand at the inner court, now you find out that in that lampstand there were almond trees there. There were almond trees, almond fruit, sorry, Almond fruit tie at those seven branches. Now, now you see, all of those things you see there, they are messages themselves. Now, the candlestick is a representation of the Holy Ghost Field Church. And the Holy Ghost Field Church, as he's speaking in tongue, manifesting signs, and doing all of those things, there must be fruit of the Spirit. Now we could understand why Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of men, the tongues of angels, I don't have fruit of love. They are all sanding brass. If I have the gift of interpretation of, of the scripture, the gift of all of those things, and I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I have, burn my body. If I don't have this fruit, they profit me nothing. So, that's a fruit. 
So how do I know a man who is in the first fourth message? He is orthodox in operation. He is orthodox in operation. Yes, there was a time there. That's why Apostle Paul went to a church. In Acts of Apostle, uh, let's check Acts of Apostle chapter 19 verse 1. He went to the church. He looked at the church. He said, Can this church looks so orthodox. Amen. He asked them, since you were saved, have you received the Holy Ghost? It's one amazing in their answer. They say, if that anything like the Holy Ghost, we are not aware of that. We are not told of that. We are not aware of the Holy Ghost. So Paul had to baptize them in the Holy Ghost. So Paul had to baptize them in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So that's also another third dimension. Now, don't see? You will need to understand this accurately. Now, if you read um, in the book of Revelation, when the third sea was opened in Revelation chapter 6, he said, touch not the barley and the wheat. Now, it takes understanding of what we are sharing to unfold and understand what the scripture is saying. Now, the barley is actually the, 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 the harvest of Passover. Is the harvest of the Passover. Now, the wheat is the harvest of Pentecost. White fruit is the harvest of the tabernacle. So now, in the book of Revelation, what is being opened is actually to gain and to actualize, to activate the third dimensional message of the gospel of the kingdom. He said, while this work is going, leave Passover work should be ongoing, Pentecost work should be ongoing, but our target is the precious fruit of the earth, which is the harvest of the third dimension, dimensional message of the gospel of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm trusting God to bet understanding in us. I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will uh, interpret all of these things in our hearts. Now, because we are trying to, we are studying to know the mysteries, the depth of the gospel of the kingdom. That's why I'm sharing in this uh, a little bit deeper dimension. Now, because it is necessary that we understand it. And some of this lack of understanding has made us not to understand our scripture. So when I'm reading the, the seal, I understand that the first trumpet, the first trumpet to the fifth, you know, a trumpet is actually the outer court experience. And the CC to the seventh trumpet is the inner court experience. And the seventh seal is the experience of the most holy place. So we must also understand that from Canaan, in the days of Canaan, to Saul was the, was the Passover dimension of the children of Israel. Now Saul came as a Pentecost man. That's why in uh, First Samuel chapter 12, and the Samuel say, is he not a wheat harvest to tell you that this is a season of Pentecost? That's why Saul operated as a Pentecostal man. We saw uh, uh, Samuel say, you will meet a company of the prophet, you will prophesy. You will prophesy. And you will meet three people, they are carrying three loaves. Very interesting. They are carrying three loaves. They will give you two. Why would they give him two? Why would not give him the three? Now, because Saul uh, didn't qualify for the feast of the tabernacle. His emphasis was on the Pentecost. That's why there was so much Pentecostal manifestations around Saul. But there wasn't really um, the fullness of the kingdom that manifests in the days of Saul until after that section. That's why you see, Pentecost has to also associate with number, number 40. That's why Saul have to reign for 40 years. I don't know if we are understanding this. Saul have to reign for 40 years. Israel, Pentecost journey was wilderness experience. That's why they have to journey for 40 years also. <coughs> Hallelujah. 
So the church, Pentecost experience, also have to be for 40 jubilee, which is 2,000 years. Now, I, I, I want to see the pattern, the pattern of, you see, God making all things beautiful in their time. So which means the church have to journey for 40. Now, Moses led Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. And Jesus have to lead, lead the church for 40 jubilee in the wilderness. So the church is in her wilderness journey. Entering the most holy place. And this is when the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom will be returned to the church. Praise God. Hallelujah. So when we look at the third dimensional message of the gospel of the kingdom, we are looking at the, the ark. I want to ask, when was the ark unfolded in Israel? It wasn't in the days of Saul. Israel never see the ark in the days of Saul. <coughs> Thank you, Father. The only time the nation of Israel, the people, I'm not talking about the priests that bear the ark. The only time the ark of God was unveiling Israel was in the days of David. When David said, let us go and bring back the ark because we did not inquire of it in the days of Saul. They have to go. They brought the ark. David have to, you know, pitch a tent on Mount Zion and open the ark for all to see. And call all Israel, come and see the ark. And this is the primary, this is the primary assignment of the company of Christ. They have the responsibility ability to bring God to the church and everyone will see God by themselves which we read in Jeremiah chapter 31 when I was explaining uh, the new covenant and everyone will know God by himself. Everyone will see God. No one will teach another again. Not a priest to come to tell you what God look like. So you must know by yourself what God you know look like and what God is. Now that's why if you watch what I said, that the first C to the fifth C is the Passover dimension. The CC, we will go in detail on the C. Um, we'll be studying the book of Revelation. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So the fifth C, the CC to the seventh C, to the CC, to the sixth trumpet. The CC to the sixth trumpet is the Pentecost dimension or the second dimension of the gospel of the kingdom. Then the third dimension is the seven trumpet. That's why if you study in Revelation chapter 10 verse 7, he said, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, now the mysteries of God will be finished. So they will unseal all the mysteries of Christ. Don't forget that Jesus said to his disciple, it is given unto you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. It is given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. And he says that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery shall be finished. So which means they have started unveiling the mystery from the outer court, from the inner court, and they will finish it at the third dimension. So, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, he said, and the angel sounded, the seventh angel sounded, the mysteries of God was finished. They finished the mysteries and the kingdom of this world, yes, and the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and it shall reign forever and ever. So it's finished. Hallelujah, it's finished. And the four and twenty-four elders which sat before God on their, you know, for God on their seat fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, O God, which art and was and had come because thou, amen, because thou have taken. <coughs> Praise God. Please can you go? Hallelujah. So, uh, because thou hast taken uh, to thy great power 
and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and the wrath is come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that they should, uh, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servant, the prophet, and to the saint. And them that fear thy name, small and great, and that thou shouldest destroy, you know, them, we destroy the earth. Look at verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the temple of God was opened. Now, where is heaven now? Heaven now is inside the man. Now, because they built Christ, and Christ and his kingdom have come inside the man. So the man become the heaven. So the kingdom of God was opened. The temple of God was opened inside the man. And there was sin in, the, in his temple. Of course, we all know that man is the temple of God. There was sin in the temple, the ark of his testament. So the ark of his testament was sin. That is to show you that the mysteries have been accomplished in man. So what is the representation of this ark? What is in the ark? There are three major things that are in the ark. Number one is the table of the law. And that means that the writings of God, the laws of God, have written inside of the man within and without. So the man has become the testament of Christ. The man has become the embodiment of Christ. So we could see that the testament was there. What else did we see in the ark? Amen. What else did we see in the ark? We saw what they call the Oma of manna. It's a measure of manna. How come about the, own, the, the, the manna in the ark? How did it come? How did it originate? How did we find manna in the ark? When they were joining in the wilderness and God provided manna for them. They were to eat it every day of their life. That's actually a representation of God's word. You see, but they are not to leave it overnight. Because if they leave it overnight, it will go spoil. They wouldn't leave it overnight. It would go spoil. In other words, all the revelation from the fourth or fifth day cannot handle corruption. It cannot handle corruption. Oh my God. But you see, but the manner of the sixth day, hallelujah, the manner of the sixth day endured unto the seventh day. It is the manner of the sixth day that they eat on the seventh day. That means on the night of the sixth day, divinity touch it. The hand of the Lord touch it. It become incorruptible. And God said to Moses, take an oma of manna, take a measure of this manna and put it in the ark. Now, we are handling the third dimension of the gospel of the kingdom, which has to do with immortality, which has to do with the fullness of Christ. Take the omer of manna and put it inside the ark as a testimony of God's provision of immortality. God's provision of eternal life. So when the ark of God was opened in heaven, we saw men that the testament of God had been written. We saw men who had become, you know, that, 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 that the mortality had been swallowed by immortality. We see preservation that corruption can't touch them like that manner. And then we see the rod of Aaron, the scepter of authority. So authority of the earth realm had been given unto this man. Now that's why when we begin to press into the three-dimensional message of the gospel of the kingdom, we no longer talk about the eight issues. We talk about government of God. We talk about scepter. We talk about dominion. We talk about establishing the kingdom of God upon the earth. So we shift emphasis from the earth to Zion. We shift emphasis from the earth to Zion. Now because we are already looking at the kingdom life. Oh my God. I don't know if somebody... You see, this is a high point. This is a high dimension. Now, there's nothing wrong for us to pray for God give us food to eat. God make us fearless. But when we go to that dimension, all of these things, we've gone past them. Now because in heaven, there's nothing like thou shalt not fear. Nothing like that in the heavens. So all of those truths, be bold, be confident, thou shalt not seek. I am the Lord that healed thee. Now they're all in the second fold of the mysteries of the gospel. But when we go to the third dimension, we're actually harnessing eternal life in which there is no shortcoming, in which there is no, you know, is the perfection of all things. 
And this is a point that blindness, that blind, blindness has happened to the church. The church have seen Passover fulfilled. The church have seen Pentecost, and we thought that the journey ended there. Pentecost is not just an, a, you know, you know, name of a church. Pentecost is one of the feasts that God gave to Israel. Why it's called Pentecost? The scripture said, Pentecost did not start at the house of apostles. No. In Acts 2, we said, the days of Pentecost drew near that all the Jews abroad, people began to come to Jerusalem to keep Pentecost. So that day was the day something was fulfilled. If Passover was fulfilled, Pentecost was also fulfilled of necessity. We're going to see uh, the fulfillment of the Feast of the Tabernacle, wherein the fruit of the earth mature, and God come down to, to earth to feast the fruit. And the fruit are the sons of God. In other words, the sons of God are matured. They have coming up. Their next expectation of creation, they are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And God has been waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. So this is the three-dimensional message of the gospel of the kingdom. So it's possible that somebody is teaching about new birth, all the realities of the new birth by the grace of God, by his grace. I did that 2003, 2004, 5, 6, 7. Pentecost, we operated there by his grace. We saw a lot of manifestations. A lot of manifestation until sometime the Lord said, I will have you to begin to prophesy in Zion. That's a new dimension. Begin to prophesy and speak forth of the reality of Zion upon the earth. Speak forth government. Speak forth scepter. Speak forth priesthood. Speak forth kingdom. Speak forth Melchizedek. As it is in heaven, let it be here on earth. Now, this is the third dimension of the message of the gospel of the kingdom. We need to know this. It is very important. Touch not the barley, touch not the wheat. Let the activity of barley and wheat, but we are focusing on the fruit. That's why the book of Revelation ended in, uh, you know, um, in the tree of life, the fruit that that tree now finally produced a fruit. In Genesis, we saw the tree of life. But here, we are no longer seeing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the book of Revelation. So an aspect of a man has been judged. So the man is no longer doer. The man is just one. The man is one with God. So God has realized what he wanted from the foundation of the earth. Because what God wanted is a man in his image, after his likeness, which you have not seen, except Christ. Praise God. Somebody may say, but Adam was not, was that, Adam wasn't. Hallelujah. Adam wasn't in the, in the praise God. Maybe I can show us. Let's see uh, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 1, 26. Hallelujah. Okay, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This is interesting. Let us create man in our image after our likeness. You see that? This is, my, this, is, this is God's vision. This is what God wants. The day you say, I want to uh, build um, a company that will have 10,000 staffs, you are just declaring your vision, but you have to start somewhere from building that company. So God said, this is what I want. I want a man after my likeness. I want a man in my image. I want a man that will have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the earth, in fact, over all the earth. That's what I wanted. 
That's my desire. Praise the name of Jesus. And we could see clearly, amen, in verse 27. Please take your scripture. Look at verse 27 very uh, clearly. This is where God began the work. Amen. This is where God began the work in verse 7, in verse 27. And God created man in his own image. Hallelujah. And the God created man in his own image. In his image, God created him. What does that mean? Did we see and God created man in his image and in his likeness? No. God created man in his image. Now, because the image has to do with man having the DNA of God, having the, 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 that, you know, DNA of God. You see, but the um, likeness has to do with the character, the expressions of Christ. Maybe, I'll, I just want to bring it down for understanding more. When you want your child to, when you, when you have an estate, you are wealthy, and your vision is to have a man who will take over from you. Of course, what you have to do is to get married, get a child. Now, when you give birth to that son, that son is your image. That son has your DNA. But I will still tell you that that son is not yet in your likeness. That son at the age of age 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, cannot function in your capacity. Your characters, your understanding is not yet better. But you see, you want a man who has your capacity, who can manage that estate. So what happened here that God created man and then placed him in the Eden and begin to visit him, begin to train Adam to learn his functionality, to learn his mannerism, to learn his culture, to build man to a place that man can be his full expression. So that you, if you see God, if you see man, you have seen God. So we could say he resembled a father, but it's not like the father. There are people that resemble their father physically, but they don't behave like their father. And every father wants his son to behave like him. Every father wants his son to gain his capacity. So what God is doing, so it's a work. That's why I say we are saved. We are being saved. And we shall be saved. We are being saved means that God is building us. And that is a place of the five-foot ministry. For the equipping of the saint, for the work of, so they have to do a work in us. And that work is building and harnessing capacity in us so that we can uh, be like the likeness. So that uh, when they see us, they say, ah, they are like Christ. They are like Christ. A time will come that the church will be the full expression of all the fullness of Christ. When they have washed us, cleansed us. Like, Ephes like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. Praise God. So God is doing a work. I want us to uh, take that at hand. That God is doing a work, and that work will culminate in us being the expression of the fullness of Christ. When they have washed us, look at that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything such like, that it should be holy and without blemish. Hallelujah. So this is all uh, we have to do today uh, in gospel of the kingdom. Uh, first understand that the gospel of the kingdom is a threefold message that God gave to Noah and explained to Noah what he intend to do. Build me an ark. Build me a man. And that man is going to be a three-dimensional message. To Moses, build me a tabernacle. It's going to be a three-dimensional message. 
Israel is going to journey. It's going to be a three-dimensional journey. And you're going to appear three times. And then write to the children, write to young men, write to the fathers. Bring forth 30-fold, bring forth 60-fold, bring forth 100-fold. So there are phases of works that God is doing uh, upon the earth. And that's why if I go detail and detail and detail, we could also show you are the three um, species of men that God would have until the uh, perfect man in the image and the fullness of Christ image. May the Lord bless us in the name of Jesus. We are going to have break just for 15 minutes and then be back and take another course for just 30 minutes. Um, that's a biblical um, survey and appreciation. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Just 15 minutes.
So, can we start? Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, welcome back to the second course. Biblical survey and appreciation. Um, biblical survey and appreciation. Thank you, Pastor Victor, for what you said after the first lecture. It's encouraging. Uh, Amen. He said, wow, that was too much. I have never seen the Bible in this dimension. Uh, we now know where we are and where we are going. Thank you, sir. Praise God. And Sister Chi said, I agree completely. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Um, I thank everyone for what God is doing here. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we ask that you have your way. Thank you for granting mercy. Thank you for granting utterance and grace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, we've, been, we've talked so much on in the biblical survey and appreciation. We have finished um, canonicity of the scripture. Why the scripture was canonize the test of canonization, why some books were not canonized, why they were not accepted as inspired book. We've done all of those things. We have looked at the divisions of the Bible into uh, seven divisions, the law, the prophet, the Old Testament gave us two structures. It's called the law and the prophet. Then the new gave us five. We have the gospel, what the arts of apostle two, the epistle three, the writings of John four, and the book of Revelation five. Hallelujah. So we have five layers in the New Testament and have two layers in the Old Testament. And we said that the law comprises of Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then the prophet, the prophet comprised of from Joshua to Malachi, but yet when you come to the prophet books, we have historical books under it, which is Joshua to Esther. Then we have poetry, which is Job to um, Songs of Solomon. Then we also have the prophets, um, Isaiah to Malachi. Uh, some also went further to divide the prophet into two, major prophet and minor prophet. And I don't think there's anything like minor prophet. Praise God, they are all the prophets. Then we have the gospel, the gospel is divided into two. We have synoptic gospel, which is marked you to look. Then we have divine gospel. Marked you to look, they are a bit historical, but John is different from the, we call them the four gospel. John was a bit different. John is um, a kind of divine. At the book of John was a direct revelation of Christ. Now, the difference when you see John, John keep 
talking to Christ as eternal life. You see the word like eternal life, love, belief, and all of those things. But you see, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were historical. They were telling us how Jesus was born by Mary and Joseph, how he journeyed. Matthew said that, Mark said that, Luke also said that. But John did not give such account. John began to say, in the beginning was the world, and the world was God. So John was unveiling the divinity of, of Christ. Then we have Acts of the Apostle, it stands alone. Then we have Epistles. Now the Epistles also divided into two. We have what we call personal Epistles, like Epistle to Timothy, Epistle to Titus, Epistle to Philemon, uh, Epistle to Gaius, Epistle to the beloved lady, the third John, second John. Then we have what we call the corporate epistle. So the corporate epistle are the epistle to churches, not written to a man, epistle to the Corinthians, um, Roman, Thessalonia, Galatia, Ephesians, and all of them are called the corporate epistle. Then we also have what we call the um, writings of John. Amen. Writings of John, which comprise of the gospel of John and the epistle of John. Then the seventh layer is what we call the apocalypse. Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, which is the book of Revelation, which I said while I was teaching on the gospel of the kingdom. Now, this is the only book of the Bible that was given to the bride. All the other books were given to the church. Uh, every member of the church can read it, but you can't read and understand the revelation unless it, you are a part of the bride company. Unless you are part of the bride company. If you read in the book of Isaiah chapter 29, he said that the book was given unto me, he said, he read, he said, I cannot uh, read because it was sealed. So it's a sealed book. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, John, Daniel also is a go thy way. For these things were sealed for the end of the age. So the book of Revelation was a sealed book. That is the seventh layer of the scripture. So the first layer is the law. The second layer is the prophet. The second, the third um, layer is the gospel. The fourth layer is the acts of the apostle. The fifth layer is uh, epistles. The sixth layer, the writings of John. And the seventh layer is the apocalyptic. Praise God. The apocalyptic. So, let's look at the law of Moses. Like we said, the law of Moses referred to the five books of the Bible. They are also called Pentateuch or Torah. That is Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, these books were authored by Moses. Moses authored them. Moses authored the five books. Now, the law is the foundation of all scriptures. The law is the foundation. There is no opinion in scripture outside of the law. All the revelations from Joshua to, you know, Joshua to Revelation can be traced uh, to that book. And uh, that's why I keep emphasizing that we don't make any doctrine out of the law and the prophet. Anything you check, if it is not in the law and the prophet, they are not doctrine of Christ. All the mysteries of the kingdom and biblical doctrines are laid down in the law. All of them are laid down. So the law is a guide to understanding the scripture. So it is impossible to unlock the mysteries of the kingdom without the knowledge of the law. This is one of the problems we are having. People not understanding scripture because they were told that uh, the five books of Moses are no longer necessary. Just go and read, you know, um, John, Matthew to uh, Jude. Praise God. They will be, ah, amen. So the law 
is the first revelation of God to man. It provides worship guidelines. The revelation of divine worship and its source as is, is the source through which other books, other scriptures were developed. All other scriptures were developed by the revelation of the law. That's why I think it was as I said, the Lord had spoken. Who can bear it? Prophesy. So anything we are trying to um, prophesy must be in line with the law. Hallelujah. So it wrote all the realities of God's in type and in shadow. All the realities of God. Amen. So when you go to the book of Revelation, you saw something like, for instance, 24 elders in the heaven. They were found from the, 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 the from um, you know, in the day of the priesthood. They were actually formed from, you know, um, the sons of Aaron. Aaron had four sons. Uh, Abihu, which means God is my father. Um, who again? Nadab, which means an evangelist. You know, free. That's the meaning of Nadab, free. Then we have um, Eliaza, which means God is my help. We have also Itama, which is a kind of a tree, a species of tree that bears fruit. Amen. And I, I remember teaching sometime on the priesthood. And I said that the fivefold, that the fivefold is actually traced from uh, Aaron and his sons. Aaron, who is the representation of the apostle. And because Aaron simply means enlightenment. Hallelujah. Aaron means enlightenment, means light. Then um, Abihu means God is my father. And that is the office of the prophet. In Israel, the prophets are called fathers. Even, even kings call them fathers. Remember the king of Israel who came to Elisha and said, my father, my father. Hallelujah. Elisha called Elijah, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel. Amen. So, Abihu is a representation of a prophet. Nadab means free, the evangelist. And Eleazar means God is my help, and that is pastoral ministry. Except you receive help from God, you can shepherd the people. I have been, been a pastor for years. You see the same people you pastor, say all kinds of things against you. They talk against you. You keep loving. You keep showing love. You try to carry the burden. Amen. So you need help to stand in the pastoral office. You know, I, I told a part of Kenneth Hagin. Uh, Kenneth Hagin once said that even if you are an evangelist, you are a prophet, it's good for you to have pastoral experience for some time. So God allowed him, Kenneth Hagin, to pastor for about 12 years before he stepped into his um, major assignment. So all the pastoral experiences you are gaining, they are very important. If you want to know what I'm saying, I uh, invite someone who is not, who have never had a pastoral experience as a guest. Then invite someone who has pastors and, 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 and have known the pain of being a pastor. They are not the same, praise God. So, like I said, um, Abihu died. Nadab also died. Remaining um, Eleazar and uh, Itama. And Eleazar had 16 children. Eleazar had 16 children while Itama had eight children, making them 24. And each of the priesthood ministered in the tabernacle. They apportioned them, divided it. So they minister in their courses. You remember in uh, Luke chapter 1 about a man called uh, Zachariah. It was his course to minister at that time. So he came to wait for his ministration. He had encounter with an angel. So it was in the time of David that David had to restructure that priesthood uh, again. That's where we have the 24 elders. That's what you saw in the book of Revelation as the 24 elders. The 24 elders are 
representation of the priesthood. That's why you see them wearing their white garment. Praise God. Amen. So, uh, every thought is <clears throat> developed from the law. Everything you see in the, in the book of Revelation, you've already seen them in the law. You saw the brazen altar in Revelation, it's there from the law. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, John turned uh, to see the voice that was speaking. He saw a man standing by the lampstand. The lampstand was in the law. So we need to understand the function of the law, the place of the law. Like I said, it provides worship guidelines and revelation of divine worship. Uh, is the source through which all of that scripture is developed. It had, it hosts all the realities of God in type and in shadow. The civilization of the kingdom life and what yeah will require from men are at line in the prophet. So the law is the foundation, is the fundamental. The law is fundamental in understanding the scripture. Yeshua referenced the law in his teaching. The apostles of the Lamb Apostle Paul, all of them reference the law. So the law is vital in the communication of the gospel of the kingdom. Um, Yahweh declared the end from the beginning. So we can find the event of the age to come in the law because Yahweh set them for there. Uh, recently we have been talking in our community at uh, the age to come, the ecosystem. God had already Testeron that in Jubilee. Testeron that in the Eden. Praise God. So they are not new things. There's no new things from Ju Joshua to Revelation. They are the unfolding of Revelation of the law. So the prophets the prophets confirm and authenticate the law of Moses and further amplify the redemption plans Yahweh sets forth in the law. Hallelujah. Now, the redemptive plan actually started in Genesis 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. The seed of the woman. We crush the head of the serpent. And the law developed it further by saying that a virgin shall conceive. Bring forth a child. You go further to the gospel. Gospel, develop it more. Tell us that um, Mary gave birth to Jesus. Amen. You go to the Acts of Apostle, it develop it more. The son now see the, uh, the saint living the life of that seed of the woman. Then you go to... Um, Epistles, they begin to tell you the life, the culture. The book of Revelation now shows us how the seed of the woman finally uh, crush the kingdom of Satan. Hallelujah. So, uh, the law, the, 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 the prophet is a progressive revelation of the laid down doctrines of the law. The writings of the prophets are in agreement. They are all in alignment with, most, well, with what Moses spoke. That's why I say that the Lord has spoken. Who can bear it? Prophesy. There's no new doctrine in the prophet. I want us to know this. No new doctrine in the prophet. The prophets are the testimonies of the laws of God. They build upon the foundation that Moses laid in the law. The prophet set forth and outline the process in which redemption uh, that was revealed in the law is to be accomplished. The civilization, kingdom life, and what Yeshua required from men are also outlined in the prophet. Like the law, the prophet is key to understanding the rest of the scripture. That's why we see um, Peter will talk. He will say, this is that which Jewel said, this is that which the prophet said. James is also said, this is that which uh, was written, that I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. 
So they are all saying the same thing. So Jesus referenced the prophets in his teachings, the apostles of the Lamb, and Apostle Paul even quoted the uh, prophets in all of their epistles. So they are key in understanding the gospel of the kingdom. So the third layer of the Bible is called the gospel. The gospel is the account of the life of our Lord Jesus. It is the spiritual fulfillment of the event outlined in the law and the prophet. So we saw the seed of the woman being born. So what Isaiah prophesied fulfilled in the gospel. We saw in Isaiah chapter 53 the sufferings of Christ. All of them fulfilled there. So it is the revelation of the life of the pattern son. It revealed the reality of the biblical doctrine that was set forth in the law and the prophet. So the gospel is a valid testimony of the law and the prophet. They are testifying. That's why John chapter 1 verse 45, John 1 45. And Philip said to Nathaniel, we have found him whom the scripture did write, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Hallelujah. That's John chapter 1 verse 45. Now, the Acts of the Apostle, very important. Acts of the Apostle is a vital layer of the Bible in that it revealed the lifestyle and the doctrine of the early church. So, it's the revelation of what they learned from Yeshua. That's where they learned community life. That's where it is written how the kingdom life is to be lived. They continued in the Apostles' doctrine uh, in fellowship in breaking of bread from house to house. So all these things we are written for us to engage them. Amen. So we see uh, a New Testament life, full expression of love and unity among the brethren. We see the foundation of the early church. They are gathering together in love and in one accord. The civilization, the economy, the pattern worship in the book of Acts. I love that the economy they live together. The Bible says none lack. Nobody among them lack anything for they that had possession, have thing, they sold their possession. And distribution was made as anyone has as need. And I want to emphasize that what happened in Acts 4 is not based on circumstances. It's actually the life that God desired. We saw that in the Jubilee experience that all the people that own vineyard, they will relinquish it so that their brethren that will return from slavery will find something to eat because they had no farm, they had nothing. So they will not lay claim on their vineyard. So we saw the reputation of that in Acts of the apostles. Hallelujah. Amen. So we see the foundation of the early church the gathering together in love and all of those things. So the fulfillment of the prophecies of the law and the prophet. Now we see that it is in the Acts of Apostles that the Feast of Shavuot, what is known as the Feast of the Weeks today, we know it as Pentecost, is fulfilled. They fulfill in Acts, in Acts chapter 2. Can we see Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 and 3? Acts of Apostle, you will uh, see there when the days of Pentecost drew near, that everybody gathered to Jerusalem for the Acts. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and a sound, and a sound, and sudden, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wing, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongue as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to say something here, a very important lesson. I want us to take note of verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it is, and it sat upon each of them. 
Now, one of the vital lessons of Pentecost, that Pentecost is simply mean is it associated with fire. Now, what is the essence of the fire? Now, this fire is for purging. The fire is for purification. Now, we finished sharing something on the gospel of the kingdom, and we said that the gospel of the kingdom is a threefold message. Now, we are saved, which is our encounter with Christ. The second dimension is this Pentecost. We are being saved, and the third, we shall be saved. Now, I want to understand that when we are saved, when we give our life to Jesus Christ, at that point, our fleshly nature, we are still within us. Some of us were still lying. Even up to now, some are still lying. Some are still cheating. Some are still coveting. So the essence of Pentecost is a place of training. It's a place, a, a place of purging. Now that's why Pentecost simply means that the saint have to go through fire of purification. Peter talked uh, about that, that. That gold, ordinary gold, will be passed through fire. And you are more precious than gold. So God wants to pass the same through fire to purge them. In um, Malachi 3, he said that he will sit as a refiner to purify the sons of Levi. So that simply means that it means that we'll be under fire every day. So the cloth of tongue upon the disciple also speak of that the disciples must at every time be under fire if you are going to join it successfully through the part of the Pentecost. So God will always allow us to be under fire. That's why um, Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. So present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice is, is a... a, a an offering under fire. So what Paul is saying, present yourself under fire. Go through the fire. Go through the fire. Go through the fire. Go through the fire of praying and fasting. Go through the fire of, even when you are tired, don't give up. Study the word of God. Go through the fire of giving out your resources, even your savings, giving out your last. Go through the fire of making sacrifice, taking the place for others. Go through such fire. And I tell you, it will be fantastic. Hallelujah. So like we said, all these uh, prophecy fulfilled. So as of apostle, it's a valid evidence that authenticates the law and uh, the prophet. So what, when we see the feast of um, of uh, Pentecost will feel in art. It definitely means that what we saw in the law was actually truth. Amen. So the epistles, they are very essential part of the Bible, very essential. They are called occasional letters. Occasional letters in the sense that something occasioned is something warranted it. Um, uh, I'm going to give you example of maybe two books. I give you an example of the book of First Corinthians. First Corinthians was written because uh, certain things were not in order in that church. Paul planted the church. Apollos was their pastor. Kephas, Peter, visited the church. Uh, I believe that Peter must have told them how he stay with Jesus, how he eat with Jesus, how he walk on the on the sea, how Jesus, how they went to uh, mountain. He had a voice. Uh, how Jesus must have said, "Upon you I will build the church." After telling them the experience, they say, "Ah, now Peter, we know." Apollos was eloquent speaker. Some of them say it's Apollos. Some say, "No, it's the um, it's actually Paul that started the church." We know. Then there came division. So many divisions. So many. Some uh, we are saying that the faith is not enough. Some we are taking their brothers to the court. A lot of things were happening. Then a woman 
wrote to Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 1, 11. So the book of 1 Corinthians um, was a response to the things reported. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Cleo, that there are contentions among you. You see, that's why Paul writes, so, wrote. So that's why I call them occasional letters, something occasion them. Then there's another book called the book of Philemon. Uh, the book of Philemon was uh, written because uh, a man called Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon. So Onesimus ran away from his master. Probably he stole some money, ran away. In the process, Paul met him, converted him. He became a Christian, a child of God. He responded to the faith. So Paul uh, have to write letter, give, give it to him, go back. Go back to your master. Surrender back to him. So now when he went back, Paul wrote to Philemon, receive him, not as a slave now, but as a brother in the Lord. So that's the sense of the book of Philemon. So they were writing for, they were written for people, but the lessons there today are for us. What are, now, now because the, the things happen there are still happening in our days. So that's why we need to read them to draw lessons. Of, of course, in our days, some say, ah, I believe in TDJs. If not him, I won't listen. I believe in Adephanasin. If not him, I won't go to church. I believe in Chris Oyakilome. If not him, I won't worship. I believe in deeper life. Kumuyi. If not him, no other man of God. So that's what I say is Christ. Now this I said that every one of you said, I am of Paul, I am of Ap Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? We are, uh, we are you baptized in the name of Paul. None of us we are baptized in the name of our Jews. None of us we are, you know, cru crucified. Our Jew was not crucified for us. Hallelujah. So, um, so they are called occasional letters. They were written for correcting and settling disputes in churches. It is crucial because we are having similar uh, situation in today's church. Like what, um, what I found in the book of Philemon, I used it one day. I employed a guy. A guy came to work with me. Uh, in the process, I realized that this young man is a friend, sorry, is a son to my friend. And he wasn't in good terms with the father. So I thought about it. What came to my mind was the book of Philemon. I have to take him to his father, reconcile them. So they were written for us to learn lessons and how to handle issues. Praise God. So by the knowledge of the epistles, we know how to uh, divide God's word and apply them rightly to our situations. What we find in the epistle further is explanation, the true meaning of the things that the law and the prophet who is in type and in shadow, such as circumcision. Philemon, he said, we are not the circumcision after the flesh. We have the circumcision of the heart. So we know that what was held in type as circumcising the first king is the circumcision of the heart. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the epistle also shed more light to some of the things that, that are in the law and in the prophet. For instance, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, that Jesus is our Passover. He also said that Jesus 
is the first fruit. Amen. So we now have the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation is the climax of the Bible. The uniqueness of this book is that it was written and sealed by our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a summary of all the book of the Bible. It is the revelation of a person, Christ. The book of Revelation pictures the bridegroom and the bride. It is the revelation of the events that will take place in the future on how the bride of Christ will emerge and the new earth and the new heaven to come. So this, the book will not be understood without the knowledge and understanding of the law and the prophet. Example, the barley and the wheat mentioned in the third sea cannot be uh, understood until one understands that barley is the harvest of Passover and wheat is the harvest of the feast of the Pentecost and fruit is the harvest of the feast of the tabernacle. So these are uh, uh, the layers of the scripture and what they are all about. Then finally on this course, uh, if the Lord permit which I believe, uh, we said when we started that the Bible we are written by uh, 40 authors, about 40 authors that live at different time, different professions, but yet they speak one thing. And they have their central team. Uh, we also said when we are doing a canonicity that is Christ found in the book. So Christ is the team of the scripture. So we can trace uh, the scarlet trade of Christ. We can trace Christ from Genesis to Revelation. So we see here that every book of the Bible revealed Christ in his unique way. Genesis revealed Christ as the seed of the woman. Exodus revealed Jesus as the Passover lamb. Leviticus revealed him as the priest. The book of Numbers revealed him as the rock. The rock that followed us is Christ. Deuteronomy revealed him as the Lord giver. Praise God. He's the Lord giver. Joshua, we find Christ as the captain of the host. In Judges, we find Christ as the um, restorer and the deliverer of his people. Praise God. We saw him as the restorer and the deliverer of his people. In the book of Ruth, we see Christ as our kinsman. Hallelujah. He's a kinsman. He has to be our brother. Uh, Hebrew call him our elder brother. He has to come from the lineage of Abraham so that he can have the legitimacy to redeem Israel. If he wasn't from the tribe, no, 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 no. So he has to come from, um, he has to be made a seed of man to have the legitimate right to redeem the entire creation, to be our kingsman. Our kingsman is one who buy us back from captivity. Praise God. And the person that we redeem us must be your nearest kingsman. Remember, in the days of roots and all of those things, amen. Um, when, uh, is it Opet? Yes. Found roots. Is it Opet or Boaz? Either of them, praise God. Is it, is it Boaz? Amen. I think Boaz. Um, Boaz said that I'm not the one. I'm not the nearest kingsman. So when they went to the nearest kingsman, he said that he will not be able to do that. Praise God. So, so Ruth revealed Jesus as our kingsman. First Samuel revealed Jesus as the anointing oil. And second Samuel revealed him as the lion of Judah. First Kings revealed Jesus as the meal and the oil that never failed. Why second king revealed Jesus as the prophet's mantle. In First Chronicle, we see Jesus as the strength of Israel. In Second Chronicle, we see him as the glory that filled the temple. And in Ezra, we saw, we see that he's the uh, turner of uh, the captivity. 
the one that buys us, recently we begin to understand that the whole humanity had been sold to captivity. And that, that captivity is to do the will of Satan. So Satan had held every man captive. And Jesus came in Isaiah chapter 61 to preach deliverance to the captive. Amen. So that's why uh, Ezra painted him as the one who turned us from captivity. Nehemiah um, revealed Jesus as a shield from our enemy. We could see um, Luke 1, 74. We've been delivered from the hands of our enemy. We serve God without fear. As Esther, hallelujah. Esther, we saw Jesus as the scepter. Praise God. He's the one to bring us to the throne. Without scepter, you can't sit on the throne. Job revealed him as our redeemer. And in the book of Psalm, we see him as the, our shepherd. Then, the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of God. Ecclesiastes, he is the preacher. Songs of Solomon, he is the beloved of the bride. Then, Isaiah revealed him as Emmanuel, everlasting father, prince of peace. Jeremiah revealed him as our righteousness and also the spirit of prophecy. In Lamentation, Jesus was seen as the lover of Jerusalem. Ezekiel, he was seen as the strengthener of the dry bones. Daniel, he revealed himself as the fourth man. In the book of Jewel, he's the, uh, the outpourer of the Holy Spirit. Amos, the restorer of the tabernacle of David. Obadiah, the fire of the flame of Israel. So we see the revelation of Christ in all the canonized book. But you see, when you go to uh, books like uh, Maccabees, you don't see him. You go for all of those books, you see contrary things. That's why they were not canonized. So Jesus is a central theme. Jesus is the revelation of the uh, scripture. Maybe I can go on and so that we can see all of them, but I think that they are in the hand that we shared. Um, Jonah saw him as the God of all mercy. Micah, our righteous judge, Nahum, the publisher of peace. Habakkuk, the glory that covered the earth. Zephaniah, the mighty God. Haggai, the glory of the uh, latter house. Why Zachariah, he is the latter rain. Malachi, the son of righteousness. Hallelujah. So these are the revelation of Jesus in all the books of the, uh, from Genesis to Malachi. In Matthew, Matthew revealed Jesus as the king of the Jew. That's why he keeps seeing him, uh, revealing him as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Then Mark, Mark revealed him as a perfect servant. He always showed himself as a servant in Mark. Luke revealed him as the son of man. Why John revealed him as the son of God? As of Apostle, refer him as the son of David. Roma refer him as the power of God. The book of Galatia, he is the fate of God. Ephesians is the revelation of God. Philippian is the fruit of righteousness. Uh, Colossians is the fullness of God. Hallelujah. In him dwelleth all the fullness of God bodily. First Thessalonians is the righteous judgment. Second Thessalonians is the pleasure of God's goodness. Then in Timothy, seen as love, charity, and faith on fame. Uh, in Second Timothy, seen as the pillar of truth. In Titus, is seen as the grace of God, who brought salvation to all mankind. In the book of Philemon, we see him as the communication of our faith. Oxum, Hebrew, he is the express image of the Father. James sees him as the Lord of glory. First Peter reveals Jesus, reveals Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Why second Peter reveal him as the excellent glory? First John, he is the love of God. The second John, he is the truth. The third John, he is the truth. In Jew, he is the faith that was delivered to the same. And the book of Revelation reveals Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. So we could see that the entire scripture is Jesus. John 1.45 again, we have seen him, whom the scripture did write, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So the whole scripture is Jesus. 
in the volume of the book, it is written of me. So the volume of the book, the Bible, is a revelation of a person. And the essence of reading it there is that that person will enter us. We become him. Praise God. May Yahweh bless us as we have come to the end of this course. Um, biblical, biblical, severe, and um, appreciation. If you want to go down, you can go down to study more in the handout, but um, we still have the progressive revelations. Amen. Praise God. So it is my desire that the Holy Spirit will guide and open us to the truth of the scripture as we survey and appreciate the Bible. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Do not forget, if you have a question, put it on the platform. I don't think there's any question for now that has not been attended to. Uh, it is one question that Pastor Victor asks about testament. And the brother Chibos of further asks something on that also which I believe that has been answered. Okay, God bless you, give you peace, till we see on Thursday again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.